My name is Faith Howell and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Okay, thank you, Faith. Let's start off by you telling us where you are from originally. Where'd you grow up? Um, I grew up in a small town called Smithfield, North Carolina. This is about 45 minutes east of the Raleigh area. So what was it like growing up in Smithfield, North Carolina? <laughs> So growing up, um, the town of Smithfield is extremely conservative. And um, so I grew up in a predominantly white town, but I grew up um, in a black neighborhood. So when I went to school, um, even though majority of the students were of color, most of us were Hispanic or um, black, um, you know, there were a, a lot of um, really I'm not gonna say prestigious, but they were well off um, white students that were often in my classrooms. And so usually when I would go to school, it was kind of be like, almost like a code switch. So it's like, I would just have to be this other person in school to be treated a certain way by other students and by my teachers in school, and then come home and kind of like switch back to what I would you know, deem as normal. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, how many people would you say are in that city population? Uh, you said it's hard to get. So how many high schools? You said it's small. There is one. Well, we have two now. We have a um a charter school now that's with middle and high school. But before there was one high school. It's called Smithfield Selma. So the people who stayed in the town of Selma and the town of Smithfield, we all went to the same high school. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So was there a specific incident that you recall that made you aware of racism? Oh, yes, yeah, several. Um, my first incident was when I was in elementary school. And in my fifth grade, we would have like a cultural heritage week where the fourth and fifth graders would basically we would do projects about the cultural heritage within our family. And a lot of uh, my white friends would often do presentations on their Irish history or the Native American history within their family. And I would always be really confused, like, like how, like, what is my fam familial history? What is my culture? What does that look like? How can I, you know, research this, do a project on this? And I just remember uh, one of my friends was talking about like, oh, remember in slavery, we learned about this, you can do a project on that. And I'm like, I do not wanna do a project on slavery, talking about my cultural heritage. Like, I don't wanna do that. It's not, you know, you can do a project on, on slavery as well, like, you know? And it just really rubbed me the wrong way. And then from that point on, I just started noticing different, the way I'd be treated differently um, by teachers and by other um, faculty members around school. So can you tell a little, say a little bit more about being treated differently by your teachers? Mm -hmm. um, I read a lot. That was always, I guess, my form of escapism because of where I grew up. I would always find myself digging into some kind of book because I thought like books would like take me to another place. So I'd always heavily read. And so my favorite subjects were um, English and history. And I remember um, I was getting tested to be placed in AIG, which was like the advanced, uh, where a lot of advanced students would be placed. And I remember having to take the test multiple times, whereas my white counterpart students would only take it one time and they would get, you know, their result. Um, I remember in middle school, I had to write a research paper and it went through several plagiarism, um, uh, databases to make sure I wasn't plagiarizing and things like that and so a lot of times it was as if like teachers would just assume because of my basic group of friends that the work that I produced in the classroom was not legit. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so was there anyone in particular that you could talk with about how to navigate racism as a child? Mm -mm. I just thought, I thought it was normal for a better part um, growing up. Okay, so was that something that you talked about at home? What did you learn about racism at home? Anything? 
nothing. It was just kind of the way, you know, it is. It was like very, it was very normalized um, in my household. It wasn't something that, you know, my, my dad never talked to me about like what it, what happens if you get pulled over by a police officer or how do I need to conduct myself in certain situations? It never really was something that was talked about. Okay. It was just huh. something that they, I guess my parents assumed that we just understood. Mm -hmm. So they didn't feel the need to express it. So when do you, did you begin to have conversations about racism? Um, in high school, in middle school, I, I was bullied heavily um, from like seventh grade up into uh, my freshman year of high school because of my features. I remember like in seventh grade, every day lining up before lunch, like people would pick on me because of my full lips or because of how thick my hair was. And they would call my hair nappy and they would just pick on me. And I remember looking at the teacher and she would just kind of look and just like go on about her business. And so from there, I internalized a lot of things. And then it wasn't until high school where I felt comfortable enough with just expressing like, this is not okay. I should not be talked to this way. I should not be treated this way. So you began to advocate for yourself in high school. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you said that you attended a number of protests. Describe the first protest. Do you remember when that was? Um, I don't remember the time frame, but I remember the first one was in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. And... I just felt a sense of camaraderie around the people that I was with. Um, I felt a sense of unity. It was very organized and um, well structured. And it gave me an opportunity to really network um, and communicate with like minded individuals and even individuals who um, may not be completely adept to the situation, but still understand that it is a, there is a problem and I want to be a part of the solution. So um, the first protest that you went to was in response to the murder of George Floyd in Ahmaud Aubrey. Is that the yes? Okay. So uh, that was during the summer. How did you find out about the protest? Do you remember? Uh, someone shared a flyer about it um, in a group message, and we just decided to go. Okay. And when you say we, who was we? Um, it was just, we have like a, not we, you keep saying we, but there's a collective, I'm um, in Greensboro, and we are community organizers and activists. And so amongst the group, we decided, a few of us decided to go and attend. Okay. Do you mind saying the name of that collective? We don't really have a name. We're just individuals with a common goal who just okay. communicate regularly. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And so you left Greensboro. You went to Raleigh where there was a group of people, a protest. What discussions did you all have, if any, about any concerns of, um, because there's a pandemic taking place. Mm -hmm. So um, did you have any concerns about that? Not really. We all, we, you know, we all had masks. We all just took the precautions necessary that we needed to take, being that we were in the middle of a pandemic and, you know, protest. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about that in Raleigh. Where do you recall where it was in Raleigh? Um, what time of day? How long were you out there? What did you see? Um, I just remember being there in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, it started off at some park, but we got there a little bit late. So we just kind of like followed. We looked for groups of people and like, okay, I think these are the protesters. And we were there from like that afternoon around three, four o'clock. And we stayed there until oh, maybe 11 or 12 that night. And my role went from like meeting people and talking with them about the issues and learning more about the issues and what we can do uh, within our own communities to pouring milk for people on their eyes who were being tear gassed or helping, you know, um, you know, elderly or young people find their way to their cars. Like it really turned into that sort of thing. 
So was there tear gas? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so say more about what you saw. Um, so what I saw, there was like a, a blockade of police officers in their gear and their shields. And um, a couple feet away were just a group of protesters. And I'm not sure, I think someone, there was a water bottle that rolled by the foot of one of the officers. And from there, they just threw tear gas um, mm -hmm. at the group. And then, you know, everyone was scattering. And I just remember seeing there was like an elderly lady with her granddaughter who was out there. And it, things turned really quickly. And um, my first instinct was just like to help them, you know, get out of the way because there's no telling how fast she can move or what happens if she falls or anything like that. And so from there, it just turned extremely chaotic. Mm -hmm. okay. So how did you feel? Um, you said that you all wanted to go out there as a collective. Uh, what were some of your goals going to the protests? Um, the first goal was just to connect and expand our network um, of individuals who do community work so we can just, we know that there's strength in the number and the power of the collective. So that was one of our first goals. My second goal was just to uh, let our voices be heard. Um, and then the third goal was just, you know, if anything happens, how can I help in the situation rather than add to the chaos? And do you feel like you were able to expand your network and to do some of those other things? Mm -hmm, definitely. I met a lot of um, friends who were like friends of friends. You know, I met people who went to school with my older brother because he went to school at NC State. And so it was just, you know, a good time at first. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, so... What do you feel like you took away from that experience? I feel like it really sort of catapulted me into the movement. Um, before I was doing a lot of just like on a, an individual basis, just like I said, advocating for myself in certain situations, advocating for certain friends their situations, talking to my brothers a bit more. Um, but going to that protest really, like, it solidified um, where my heart and my mind is as, as far as the Black community in general. And it really just sort of, like, put me in a position where I am ready and able to begin to do the work for my community. Okay. So you said that you attended other protests also. How did those protests, um, and just go ahead and tell us where those other ones were. Um, in Charlotte and in Durham and um, my hometown in Smithfield. So how did, just thinking about the Charlotte and Durham, well, I'll talk separately with you about the Smithfield because I'm mm -hmm. sure that was um, quite a different experience. But how did the Charlotte and Durham protests compare to Raleigh? How were they in any way different? They were different in that with the Charlotte and Durham protests, there were certain individuals who spoke to the group um, prior to actually marching and chanting and things like that. So there were segments of times where people were just re-solidifying why we are out here together and the importance of that and things like that. Okay, so what did you learn? Um, were they talking about things that were specific to their communities? Mm -hmm. So can you, do you remember what some of those things may have been? Um, it was more so about like police harassment and what that looks like and how that's an issue. And then there are people uh, just given a, like a brief synopsis of like their encounters with police and then um, issues within their community and how they can um, overcome certain issues and things like that. Okay. Okay. So what would you say that you learned from those protests? From those protests, I learned like the importance of just making sure that everyone there has a 
at least a pretty solid background on why they are there. Because mm-hmm. I've seen, you know, in Raleigh, there there are people who are there for a common agenda, and there are people who are just there just to make noise, just because they know it's going to be somewhat chaotic, and just using that opportunity to do whatever and making sure that like, hey, if we're protesting together, this is what we're gonna be doing. This is what we're about. This is what we're not about. And if you're about, you know, something that we're not about, this may not be the space for you. Mm -hmm. How did people respond or handle people who were um, perhaps not there for the right reasons? There were a lot of like accountability people, uh, well, from what I saw with the men, especially a lot of men were holding other people accountable, like, hey, man, we're not, that's not cool, we're not doing that, you mm-hmm. know, and then that would easily de-escalate situations. Okay, okay. Was there anything that surprised you about the protests that you saw happening? Mm-hmm. Especially in Raleigh, it just surprised me about how, how things can quickly go left, and understanding like when a protest is no longer you know a thing of the collective where there's people where there's individuals who are just doing things for their own agendas for their own reasons Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so smithville you went back home there was a demonstration there do you know who organized that one I don't know who organized it. I just, someone shot me a flyer and they're like, hey, we've seen that you've been at these protests. Can you come back home and protest with us? And I was like, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what role did you play there? Um, so their protest, well, our protest was a bit different. We started out on, um, we started out on the steps of our, of our courthouse and we exchanged in just a community dialogue amongst each other. And then we were able to have a quick dialogue with the mayor who showed up and with a few of the officers who showed up. Mm-hmm. Okay, so how, how many people do you think were out there that day? It, it was no more than about 75 people. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, it's a small town, so that's it is a small people, town. <laughs> that's probably a lot of people. Was that a multiracial group that showed up? Mm-hmm. It was. Mm-hmm. So, how did you feel about that having grown up there? Did you feel like any progress was made through that um, protest? Mm-hmm. I do, because for starters, nothing like that ever happened uh in my hometown (laughs) you know when people heard about it there are people who were like there's a protest really here uh is this real like i don't know like i'll show up if you show up it was that sort of thing Mm -hmm. um and we immediately got a lot of support from community members just driving by seeing us people were honking their horns for us and saying hey this is great we love to see this um and I think that it also allowed like the, for the community to have a dialogue that we had not had in a long time that we needed to have. Um, for example, there were a few individuals who were voicing certain opinions toward police officers, but there was like a bit of a language barrier. So they had certain opinions that they weren't able to like articulate in a way that officers could really just hear and digest and respond back. Um, so I saw that was a thing and I was able to help like facilitate that. Um, there were like, we have resources within our communities that certain people don't know about and certain people need. So we identified needs in our communities that can be met with resources that we do have. So that was a huge plus. And then just the overall protesting, like marching through downtown Smithfield in general was like, Sometimes people need to see things to believe that a change can actually happen. So we were able to provide that for the community as well, because like my mom, she had been doing a lot of research on uh, my familial history. And for at least like six generations back, my grandfathers, my grandparents were slaves in the town of Smithfield. And so that just blew my mind. I'm like, wow, so our family has really been here for a minute now. 
so being a part of something that like my ancestors probably never would have dreamed of just meant a lot you know in and of itself too and i think it also speaks to the fact that that um your family has helped to build and develop that city so i mean you mm -hmm. are um certainly invested in what it looks like in the future mm -hmm, absolutely yeah so what would you like to see for Smithfield in the future? Uh, I, would, <laughs> I would like to see our community facilities being used for the community. For example, like in my neighborhood that we grew up in, we had a family life center. And for a good period, at least three and a half years, it turned into more of a police training facility, which a lot of the people in the neighborhood saw as a huge issue because it's like, I don't want to say like I don't want to say I grew up in, like in the hood, but it's a pretty impoverished area. And for the one place that community gatherings did happen, they turned it into a police training facility. Like that was a huge red flag for us, but no one knew what we could really you know do about it until now. And so I just want to see resources being used for the community the way they should be. Mm -hmm. So um, you're a student at UNCG. Your major is what? I'm majoring in psychology and minoring in African-American diaspora studies. So what are you planning on doing when you graduate? Uh, I might take a short break before heading into grad school. Mm -hmm. Do you see that the protests and, and um, what you've been involved in these last few months, do you think that, how do you think that that will affect what you do once you graduate and get into your career? Um, it just solidified my career geared more towards uh, the Black community and people of color. I've always, like my heart has always been in the place, but now my mind and my heart are in that place now. And so it's definitely going to influence the way that I advocate for the community, the way that I serve my community, and the way that I represent my community. Good. So um, let's say 10 years from now, when people are hearing various things about Black Lives Matter and protests, particularly going on at this moment, um, what do you want people to know and to remember? about it i want people to know that it's not a one and done deal that black lives matter has been a thing before black lives matter was even established you know it was it was brought out in june in juneteenth 1865 when we found out that you know slaves are free that was black lives mattering movement through the reconstruction period was black lives matter and it's all about progress. It's, it's never gonna be, okay, we're done with the work. There's always gonna be work to do and there's always gonna be progress to make. And we just wanna make sure that we're gonna be on the right side of history. Okay. Good. Um, so right now there are conversations um, about um, Black Lives Matter and those conversations from certain people who are not involved and who do not understand the protests are not um, necessarily the most positive ones. And so if you were able to be in a space as, as you have been just talking in, in Smithfield, what is it that you would want people to understand about why you are involved now? Um, in these protests? Um, I would just reflect on my experience as a Black woman in America. Um, and there are many things that I have experienced and I've had to gone through that I would not have to otherwise if I wasn't a Black woman in America. And that, you know, Black Lives Matter is not about saying Black, only Black Lives Matter. We're just trying to say we matter too. And, you know, we wouldn't have to say that we mattered if we were treated as if we did it in society. Mm -hmm. okay. Good. Is there anything that you would like to say that hasn't been covered already? No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.